Welcome. This podcast will be an introduction to the basics of lung ultrasound. My name is Stella Savarimuthu. Special thanks to Dr. Cameron Baston and the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania for his guidance in creating this podcast. During this presentation, we will review one, controls and functions of the ultrasound machine, two, techniques for acquiring images, and three, interpretation of key lung ultrasound findings. As with all imaging modalities, lung ultrasound has its limitations. Firstly, ultrasound can only detect pathology that reaches the lung periphery, as normal lung will scatter sound waves before reaching deeper findings. More on this in a minute. Secondly, lung ultrasound can be technically challenging due to rib shadowing and patient variability in size and complexity of disease. Finally, this is an operator-dependent process. To be effective, you have to keep practicing, hence this podcast. We'll begin by reviewing some basic principles of ultrasound. Before each scan, be sure to review the following four items. First, choose your probe according to desired frequency and depth. For structures that are more than six centimeters deep, such as lung parenchyma, use the cardiac or low frequency probe. For structures that are less than six centimeters deep, such as the pleura, use the linear or high frequency probe. For lung ultrasound, choose your probe based on the clinical question. If you're solely concerned with the presence or absence of pneumothorax, use the linear probe. If you're trying to diagnose a parenchymal process, use the cardiac probe. Second, select your exam preset. You will choose your preset according to the area you are scanning. This makes subtle changes to the image to optimize your exam. As a warning, the lung ultrasound preset is great for the pleura and lung parenchyma, but the abdominal preset is the best for pleural effusions. Third, adjust your gain to make black structures look black, for example, fluid in a vessel. A quick review of terms. Structures are termed hyperechoic if they appear bright or white, hypoechoic if they appear dark, anechoic if they appear black, and isoechoic if they appear gray in comparison to surrounding structures. As reference, bones appear hyperechoic, fat is hypoechoic, and vessel lumens appear anechoic. A common mistake is to increase the gain to improve the quality of your image. However, as you can see, this will often produce more visual artifact. Finally, set your depth. Set your depth to keep your area of interest in the middle third of the screen. If looking at lung parenchyma, Set the depth for parenchyma to at least three times the depth of the pleura, which usually translates to 10 to 15 centimeters. Otherwise, set the depth so that the pleura is in the middle third of the screen. Now, to obtain your images. Start by orienting yourself on your screen. Ensure the marker on the probe is aligned with the marker on the screen. The longitudinal view orients the probe along the sagittal plane, defining your axis in the caudad or cephalad directions. The transverse view provides an axial cut, defining your axis in the left-right direction. Now to scanning the lungs. Lung ultrasound relies on interpretation of artifacts. 
Remember that air dissipates ultrasound waves. Therefore, the only visible structure in a normally aerated lung is the pleura. However, these artifacts are consistent in disease states, as we will discuss in a minute. Regardless of patient positioning, hold the probe longitudinally, indicator towards the patient's head, to produce the bat sign, made up of the upper and lower ribs, the bat wings, and a pleural line. Lung artifacts follow consistent patterns and specific disease states. Here are a few key lung findings to know. The pleural line, seen on ultrasound as a hyperechoic horizontal line, moves in sync with respiration, resulting in lung sliding, which is the movement of the visceral against the parietal pleura. This video shows the glistening or shimmering of the pleura, where each white pixel of the pleural line changes to shades of gray throughout the respiratory cycle. You can also visualize lung sliding by pressing the M mode button and freezing after a full respiratory cycle. In normal lung, the screen will demonstrate a long, uniformly pixelated strip that moves with respiratory variation, creating the so-called seashore appearance. Lung pulse describes a subtle rhythmic movement of the pleura that is synchronous with cardiac beats. This can help rule out a pneumothorax, particularly in patients with complex lung appearance. Here's what it looks like in M mode, where you can see vertical stripes of sand in the seashore sign. The absence of lung sliding occurs when the parietal and visceral pleura no longer touch or move against each other, and can indicate a pneumothorax, effusion, blebs, inflammation, adhesions, or scarring. The parietal pleura can still be seen moving with respiration in this clip, but does not shimmer. In a pneumothorax, this is visualized as several pixelated strips of varying densities, also known as the barcode sign. A-lines appear as a series of horizontal, hyperechoic lines that arise from the pleural line. This is a reverberation artifact that results from the reflection between the transducer and parietal pleura, and confirms the presence of air in the lungs, A for air lines. Absence of A-lines most often means that the probe is not perpendicular to the pleura, which can be challenging given that the curve of the pleura does not always run parallel to the skin. Continue to move your probe until you have an ideal perpendicular view. You should see either A-lines, B-lines, or consolidation. B-lines are also reverberation artifact. However, they appear as sharp vertical lines that move with lung sliding and occur with increased density of the airspace or interstitium. For example, when there is fluid in the lung or interstitial thickening. Note that B-lines can indicate edema, but are also present in a variety of other conditions. B-lines and cardiogenic pulmonary edema are typically in every lung zone. B-lines and ARDS, by contrast, can be interspersed with areas of A-line patterns. In conditions such as pneumonia, atelectasis, or contusion, B-lines are focal and confined to one area. Because B-lines are reflections of the pleura, they are absent in a pneumothorax. Fewer than three B-lines in a space is considered normal. The major and minor fissures, for example, each cause one B-line. Three or more, however, is pathological. Consolidation on ultrasound will appear similar in density to the liver. 
Consolidation can occur with an array of conditions, infection, infarct, malignancy, trauma, or complete atelectasis. And while certain sonographic clues can help differentiate etiology, these often require more advanced technique. Pleural effusions are easily visualized in the dependent portions of the lungs along the costophrenic sulci. However, it is important to remember that loculated effusions can occur in non-dependent areas of the lung. In simple effusions, you can sometimes see a tentacle-like structure, which represents atelectatic lung. When looking at the diaphragm, if the aerated lung can be seen sweeping from left to right on the screen, this is called the curtain sign, or lung curtain and excludes the presence of an effusion. The findings we have discussed are incredibly useful in aiding your diagnosis, but can't be used in isolation. To illustrate this, we will review a few cases. Case one, you were called to a rapid response for a 72-year-old woman with heart failure and decompensated cirrhosis with hepatic encephalopathy being evaluated for new onset hypoxia. Per her primary team, you note she has been receiving albumin during her inpatient stay. Ever the diligent clinician, you place a probe in her chest and observe the following images. Scanning the lungs, you see that she has A lines in the upper lung fields and what appears to be a consolidation in the right lower lung field, consistent with a right lower lobe pneumonia. Given these findings, you start empiric antibiotic therapy and avoid diuresing a patient with an already tenuous volume status. Case two, you are evaluating a patient in the MICU who is now newly hypoxic post-intubation and line placement. While waiting for the x-ray tech, you note the following an ultrasound. Using your linear probe, you notice this patient lacks B lines and more importantly, lung sliding. You apply M mode and note the telltale barcode sign with absence of lung pulse. You correctly and immediately diagnose your patient with a pneumothorax. Case Imagine that you instead notice what seems to be an inconsistent pattern. You notice that you have lung sliding on the right, but do not have lung sliding on the left. However, your lung pulse is present bilaterally, ruling out pneumothorax. Your unifying diagnosis is right mainstem intubation. Your lung pulse remains as the heart continues to beat. However, you are no longer ventilating your left lung, and therefore do not see lung sliding beyond movement induced by the heart. Finally, case three. You are evaluating a patient on a solid oncology service with new onset shortness of breath. Your differential in this patient with non-small cell lung cancer and chemotherapy is broad, though you are most suspicious of either volume overload or pulmonary embolism. Probe in hand, you find this patient has diffuse A lines without evidence of B lines and also exhibits positive lung sliding throughout rendering alternate diagnoses, including pneumonia, pneumothorax, and pulmonary edema, less likely. Your pretest probability for pulmonary embolism increases, and you send your patient to CT scan. This concludes our podcast on lung ultrasound.